I'm, I wanted to start asking you how you got to be a playwright. Why and where did you start and what made you begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd always been writing, uh, you know, poetry and short stories since I can remember. Uh, but when I started writing in other people's voices is when I felt the train find its tracks. Mm -hmm. And so what, what sort of stuff were you writing in those early days? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Sort of a mixture of, a mixture of sort of, um, of fantasy, mm -hmm. like sort of otherworldly things, and the first grasping towards um, political writing, mm -hmm. which, thank God, it's all sort of gone missing because I think it was terribly naive, <laughs> well meant, but terribly naive. Yeah. yeah. And so where did you go from there? Uh, Joan Harris bundled up a number of my plays, sent them to Ray Lawler at the Melbourne Theatre Company. Mm -hmm. I went in there for a chat thinking I was going to the Vatican, which I sort of was, and um, they offered me a year as playwright in residence, mm. and I didn't even know what that meant, except they gave me a desk and a typewriter, as it was, mm. and I sat in on rehearsals, um, which was the most instructive thing, just watching different directors work, people like John Sumner, Ray Lawler, Bruce Miles, um, I just used to spend my whole day sitting and watching plays being rehearsed. And that was back in the days, I'm guessing, with NTC were doing lots of very large cast shows yeah. and things, like quite a different yeah, big scenario stuff. to now. Yeah. Big stuff. Yeah. Big Shakespeare's and big Brecht's and you know, all that sort of stuff. It was quite bold, mm. Mm. exciting. Yeah. And did you, did you write anything for them that, that year? Or? Yeah, I wrote a I wrote a uh, play called A Pair of Claws, which went on in their tiny theatre um, above the Athenaeum, the Athenaeum Two, which Ray directed, which Patricia Kennedy and Michael Duffield were in, um, and that seemed to go well. Uh, then I wrote a bit more for them, and then I sort of got a bit tired of the sort of uh, slightly boring mainstream deal of the company mm -hmm. and sort of branched out a bit. Mm -hmm. And we're talking, this is the 80s we're talking? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so when you branched out, where, was that t towards Playbox then? or First of all, independently, mm -hmm. um, which is about the biggest mistake you can ever make. <laughs> I didn't even have a house to mortgage, but if I had, I would have. Yeah. Um, sent us broke, but it was all right. We put on a few productions and then I connected uh, to what was then Playbox, now Malthouse. And uh, that was very, very fruitful years mm. working at the Malthouse. Mm. Very fruitful. Because Sex Diary of an Infidel, that was in the first Malthouse season, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, I remember that. And, um, and so then... I just sold it on title. I do. I actually do remember yeah. getting the brochure and going, I must see that. Yeah. <laughs> People said, what's it about? I said, who cares? Look yeah. at the title. <laughs> it was, and that, there was a very, I remember it's a brilliant production. It was. Yeah. It was extraordinary and toured and all the rest of it. Um, so what, in terms of that and politics, did, the, did those things develop side by side or in conversation or? I suppose in conversation. I mean, I've always been involved in politics. Mm. Um, I've worked a lot as a, a speech writer for the ALP. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that working in, working in theatre, that is speaking in someone else's voice, is actually a really handy skill for a speechwriter, a political speechwriter to have, mm. because it means that your ear is attuned to someone else's tone, someone else's language, um, so it feels more natural for them. Mm. Mm. And who've you who, who've you written for mostly in politics? Steve Brax. Uh -huh. 
and was that was that a was that a process of getting to know him and then writing in that voice or we gelled pretty instantly yeah i'd worked for john brumby before um and john is a much more formulated uh kind of character knows exactly what he wants and you must deliver mm. uh that's not a criticism that's mm. just who he is, he is yeah. um steve when i started working with steve much more much more open much more um, interested in your approaches mm -hmm. and it went beyond speech writing it sort of went into sort of you know working on presentation and stuff like that which mm. i loved mm. um so all this talk talk about politics of course brings me to crazy brave yep I've got a lot, a, a lot of different kinds of questions about it, but one of the things that I'm really interested in with that play is how it seems in hindsight to have predicted a kind of political landscape. And you know, obviously, particularly in relation to terrorism. Mm. Um, and, because I, I, I remember seeing it, reading it, when it was very first out of your hands and in the company and me just going, wow, you know, the, the whole idea of it seems so... Absurd. It, well, kind of absurd, I guess, but exciting. That's how, that's you know. how it was received. It yeah. was received as an absurdity. Yeah. Uh, this sort of stuff doesn't happen in this country. Mm. Two months later, we had the World Economic Forum in Melbourne mm. and there were riots. Yeah. And, well, look where we are now. Yeah. Um, I'm not claiming any, you know, brilliant prescience, but... Um, I could feel something boiling. Yeah. This, the central thing in, in, or the central sort of plot point in Crazy Brave with Alice walking out of that marriage with no notice and no warning and mm. hi well, hiding is the wrong word, but vanishing from her life. Is that, did, was that something that came to you in a blinding flash or something that you kind of went, I've always just, it's such a fascinating central premise mm. that someone just it reminds me of like iris murdoch or something you know that mm. someone just leaving their life in that way or is that something that you've had, had known someone that's done that or no i don't know where that came from um i was interested in the idea of someone who was a revolutionary in a contented country yeah and someone who was a revolutionary in a contented marriage mm but had this burning frustration mm. about domestic life, about political life. And as she says, uh, she wanted to set fire to the undergrowth mm. and drive us all onto the plane. Yes. Now that's the vanity of the revolutionary. Mm. I know best. Mm. I know how to change your life for the better. <laughs> well, thanks Lenin. <laughs> thanks, thanks Stalin yes. thanks Mao because yeah. that was a great idea um, but it's also that kind of passion that is the only change agent mm. that's going mm. um, and I wanted to uh, see that happen out of something that, out of a very conventional middle class Australian milieu mm -hmm. I sort of wanted, wanted to see it happen Mm. she burns mm. yes and i mean the, that kind of that central scene between the between she and um and the, and the husband yeah where they have they have those extraordinary monologues to each other but you do see a lot of that vanity there don't you yeah in in in, in that in that and he scene. calls her out for that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's incredibly brutal that yeah. relationship and um, brutal in, in the way that only a relationship that is really founded in love and great sex can be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All and, other relationships are polite. And so that that so romantic, you know, that that thing that he describes about the the boat coming around the, with all the flowers and mm. coming around the bend of the river and and her, you know, it's such you just kind of it, it's really interesting because it's I found uh, watching it at the time and when I first read it and when I read it again now, there's so much of me that wants that 
well, I kind of want them to get back together in a very disgusting kind of Hollywood way. Yeah. <laughs> but it seems like they would have been good, you know. Oh, undoubtedly. Yeah. 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 Is The Older Man based on anyone particularly? No. Um, no, I've, I've never been able to sort of um, access uh, actual people. Mm-hmm. Because I find it too limiting because you have to end up being true to them. Yeah. <laughs> and who wants to do that? Uh, no, Harold is... Um, he's someone who's, who was a firebrand in his day, got above himself, stuffed up and was ostracised. Mm. And is now living in his you know, bed sitter. Um, in poverty, basically, mm. uh, and looking at the next generation, Alice, and kind of trying to prevent her from making the mistakes that he did. Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, is doomed to failure, because the, their relationship, um, their relationship is a relationship that I'm most happy with. In all of my writing, actually. Really? Right. Yeah. Mm. Because they are both father and daughter, mm. but there's a bat squeak of sex between them. Yes. And they're rivals and competitors. And I think she is the... Bruce Miles, who played Harold in the original production, he said a very insightful thing to me. He said that Alice is the first person that Harold has ever loved. Right. Mm-hmm. Unconditionally. Mm. And so when she fucks up, that's what makes him angry. Mm. And you're only angry with people you love. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, yeah. people you don't love, you don't care about. Yeah, yeah. You may not want to answer this, which is fine if you yeah. don't. But I, I'm interested in your view about the the kind of um, acts that uh, acts that are described in that play. The the you know the the wonderful thing about throwing the shit in the in the in the opening of the <laughs> is, it, is it it wasn't the casino. Was I, am I, museum or museum, something? Museum. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that as a as a real live in Melbourne? Or Sydney, or wherever you happen to be. What do you think about people doing things like that? Do you stupid? Yeah. Mm. Because uh, because it's weak and it's vain, mm. and that's why um, Alice, who's attuned to the next thing and always wants the next thing, is vulnerable to this guy Jim Morgan who comes along and says, "Let's take it to the next level." Mm. Mm. You're just hanging around with a group of pranksters who muck up you know, auctions at wealthy houses and throw shit at the openings of the museums and, mm. you know, you're being silly. You're being adolescent. Yeah. Uh, you want to do the real thing? Let's do the real thing. Mm. And she bites. And what do you think about the real thing? Do, do, does, does, it, does it solve anything, do you think? Or is it... I mean, it's one of the things about the play. It's so marvellous that it, you, you are presented with it and you have to kind of deal with it I'm just curious about your personal view Um, does terrorism work yeah or is it is it forgivable or is it if I knew the answer to that I wouldn't have written the play sure yeah Um, you know the cliche is you know one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter Mm. um I don't know the answer to that question. Mm. Mm. No, well, it's, I suppose <laughs> at the end of the day, there probably isn't isn't one. But it I is. mean, you know, the, the Algerians fighting from the liberation from the French, go for it. ISIS, yeah, mm, not so much. Yeah. Now, is that to do with my attitude to radical Islam? Mm. Yes. Mm. Um, And I suppose, yeah, 
Oh, I was just about to say there's a thing about oppression there too, but of course that's, that is the ISIS argument. So yeah, um, that, that pretty much shuts itself down. But it is, I mean, I do find in that play, you know, the constant... And fascists always exaggerate the extent to which they're oppressed. Yeah. Because they have to. Yeah. Because they have to come off a really low base. Look at you. I mean, you know, look at Germany. You know, look at you. You're being absolutely, totally oppressed. You must rise up. Mm. They hate you. Da, 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 mm. Dot dot dot. Mm. And when you say you were you were boiling with stuff at the time when you were writing it, was it was did any part of you? Sense what you know that 9 11 was what was it? it was a year later, wasn't it? Almost, mm -hmm. um, did any part of you sense that 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 layer that level of political unrest was on its way? Yep, and what can you remember what suggested that to you? Or, no, um, I know that um, there's a stage direction in the published version of Crazy Brave which has never been used. Um, but it opens with Egyptian music. Mm. No one ever used it because they went, why? Why are you using Arabic music at the beginning of this? I said, I don't know. And they said, there's no Arabic reference in the whole play. I said, but I want Arabic music at the beginning. And they went, no, we're not doing it. Wow. And so no one's ever done it as far no. as you know. Because you'd think... And now it would just look like a cliche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so, for instance, with Crazy Brave, did you start knowing that Alice was going to end up in prison? Yeah. Um, most, yeah, uh, yes. Most plays begin, for me, with the final image. Mm -hmm. And I work back. Right. It's like, okay, how did we get there? And so, you, what, you saw her in a, in a cell? A, yeah. Yeah. And went, why, why is she here? Why is she here? And do they, do they, do they come to you like just bolts from the blue? Or? Yes. And are you that, are you that kind of, what, ha what happens to you as a writer when that happens? You scribble it down and get, get furious and you know, stay up all night and do all that? Or, yeah. And what's, is that, is that pleasurable? No. That's unfortunate. <laughs> no, it really, it really isn't. I mean, it's it's nice to finish. I mean, the two greatest words in the English language are the end, mm. um, <laughs> or curtain, or something. <laughs> um, no, it's not. I don't. No, I don't find writing pleasurable. It's. I find it um, necessary. Mm -hmm. Because, d in 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 a personal sense, or yeah, or I have to get the shit out of me. Yeah into the world yeah. and you know there's there's an arrogance that's associated with that mm. because um, it implies that I believe that what I have to say or what my people have to say is worth hearing mm. um, but it's release 